So it's very nice to have you, Seth, on this fifth edition of Trace Talks. Uh, it's a lovely day today, and uh, we're very excited to have you. Thanks, Amit. I'm happy to be here. Great. So tell us a little bit about yourself and you know, how you ended up you know, where you are today. Sure. So my name is Seth Hilbrand. I'm one of the lead developers for the KiCad EDA project, and I'm the founder of KiCad Services, which is the KiCad project's corporate arm. We provide the interface level between KiCad and the rest of the world at large. So when I say that, I mean, if you want to do business with KiCad, you need someone to sign a contract. Uh, KiCad needs someone to pay developers, to rent space for events, to do all of these things that require contracts in, in, the, in the modern world. KiCad Services provides that. And we are the funded development arm. So we employ four full-time developers at the moment and through donations to the KiCad project, which we, we manage, we also pay our part-time developers, the people who come to the project who want to contribute. They feel like it's a good mission. We're reaching people. The KiCad services also provides that uh, that element. So building building the community at large is is one of our core missions. I started with KiCad almost ten years ago now. Let me think back. I guess I started as a KiCad user twelve years ago. Uh, started contributing to the project about ten years uh, ten years ago, and I've been a an active member of that of that community of, of our community as as a whole since uh, since that time my initial work with the with the project was focused on very specific areas and as we built that up i saw that there was a lot of potential in KiCad as a vanguard of the open hardware movement. When I say open hardware, I mean as an analogy to the open source software movement. 15 years ago or so, 15, 20 years ago, open source software was not terribly well known. It was out there. People kind of knew what Linux was, which is one of these open source software projects, but they didn't see a strong business case for open source software as a whole. That's really changed in the past 20 years, and open source software is everywhere now. You will see projects being used by every profitable company in the world that projects that were created by people in their spare time or people who just felt like the code that they were writing the open source code that they were writing was valuable to other people and they should provide it that they had a ethical or moral obligation to share their personal creativity with the larger world and thereby make an, make an impact. We say this idea of, there's an idea of, of tikkun olam, right? right? The, this, this means literally to repair the world, which isn't an accurate translation repair is not not really repair implies that it's broken right but but the word actually is improve or, or to to make better leave it better than you found it because there's plenty of things that are are breaking around there so if open source software had a lot of these people who said i want to 
leave a legacy. I want to leave something that is useful for other people. I want to create something that benefits the world as a whole and pe other people can use and take as part of what they need to build something else, maybe to build a company that employs people, that puts food on the table, that creates benefit in the economy as a whole. So they don't have to focus on, I don't know, building the little widget that talks between their database and their uh, and their engineer's keyboard, right? There, there's, there's a connection layer there. Somebody wrote that. An individual person or team of people wrote that at some point in history, and it has been developed and used and now provides direct value so that people can focus on what they want their business to do rather than focus on writing the software or finding the company that sells the software for this, this tiny little thing that is somehow critical to their business. Open source software has opened the world to a number of businesses that wouldn't otherwise exist without it. I think that open source hardware is where software was about 20 years ago, right at the cusp of creating a defining transition from, so from hardware designs that are all closed to hardware designs that are based on op open design principles. And KiCad provides the ability for sharing those data between, between people. The open source software that makes the biggest impact you don't hear about yeah, until something goes wrong. We all hear about these security issues, the Heartbleed security issue, the there were the Log.js security issue. No one thinks about what this library that does logging <laughs> does because it's just kind of there. It's a, it's it's a library that what it did was it provided logging services. So in other words, if you wanted your, your, if you wanted your program to periodically output information about the internal state of the program to a text file or to a database or something, you would load this library and say, okay, library, write out this information. Okay, library, write out this information. And you didn't have to write that. You could just pull that library in. So you focused on whatever it was that you wanted your program to do. You didn't have to recreate the wheel every time you wanted to make a car. You just used the wheels that were already out there. Open source hardware is going to be the exact same position in five years, 10 years. And 20 years from now, if you want to build a company that needs hardware that doesn't exist right now, you will have a library of existing design elements. Five bolt buck converter, and plop it into your into your circuit. You don't have your engineers doesn't don't have to spend time recreating simple circuit parts. You can assemble it from pre existing library uh, library components that are licensed under an open hardware license. And that transition in the same way that the open software transition created opportunities for business development that wouldn't otherwise have existed because people would have had to spend their money developing all these little tiny components that aren't directly relevant to their business. Because these open hardware designs are going to exist as we go forward, people are building more and more and as they build more and more, you have this critical mass that keeps getting larger and larger. You're going to see people coming in, building businesses that we can't even conceive of right now, 
because they don't have to worry about re- spending time recreating something that they could absolutely they absolutely have the talent to build a five volt buck converter circuit. <clears throat> Not a problem. They could you know they could spend the time to do that. But because they don't have to spend the time to do that, they can focus on the interesting problem that they're going to build and the interesting company that's going to come out of that because they're able to use the existing the existing knowledge. So I see KeyCAD as providing a vehicle for creating that knowledge, for creating that existing library of design elements that new designers can take and embed in their ideas to make the next thing that we see in the world even even better. So I'm I'm excited about the future of open hardware. I'm excited about the future of the industry as a whole as we bring more designers in. I think KeyCAD has a direct role to play in that transition and I hope that as we do more people will come into the engineering field and more people will build awesome things with it. That's a great mission. Wow. It's amazing. Sierra Circuits has been working very hard for electrical engineers and PCB designers like yourself on our engineering tools. These are engineering tools to help you design faster. We want to reduce your design time and get the design right the first time. So our top tools on our website, number one is the PCB Stackup Planner. Uh, Knowing that you have a good stackup right away uh, for your design. Number two is the bomb checker. It'll do basic scrubbing, make sure your ref deses are good, your MPNs are good, the MPN matches the description. You know, all these are amazing features of the bomb checker. Uh, We also have an impedance tool, uh, which is based on Maxwell's equations. uh, And these are all for free for the PCB designer and electrical engineer. You know, please go check them out. It's all for you. So you think in five years something like this would come to fruition? I think that right now we are already seeing the inflection point. So I think what we're seeing right now is a combination of the availability of information sharing platforms like GitHub or GitLab, Bitbucket, lots of different ways of sharing these sorts of things. And KeyCAD is uniquely well-placed to take advantage of these because all of these platforms are text-based version control systems. So the sharing happens between text files. They can take binary files. They don't work as well taking binary files. And you can't do online parsing. Online parsing doesn't work as well uh, with with the binary files. KeyCAD is a text file based format because we're not trying to hide anything. We want we want everyone to know how to use our files, how to take the information contained in those files and build new things with them. And we work really well with the existing text document sharing systems out there, GitHubs and GitLabs, that will create, as time goes on, anything that gets put into GitHub, for instance, under an open hardware license, exists in perpetuity. So the next person who comes out, I was talking with a number of folks yesterday at the PCB West conference about where they find designs for certain kinds of, for STM32 reference designs, for instance. And some manufacturers or some places will have a reference design that does one thing 
I, the, the reference design does it's it's one it's one board for a reference design and it didn't do what they were what they're looking for so we went and on the KiCad website and I said well let's let's take a look here we have a library on the KiCad website of thousands of projects that are made with KiCad and this gets bigger and bigger every day uh, people submit their projects when they're uh, when they create open hardware projects and I said let's see what we have in here that uses STM32 and we scroll scrolled down and found oh, there were 20 different STM32 projects in there they're all production projects they're all in, in production right now, so they all are working. They have open source software code associated with them to run the STM32. And we not only found a number of different options for a particular person to base their idea on, but we actually we found a project that used the STM32 and an infrared camera uh, camera system which was exactly what what this person needed it, they run a battery company right that the, they wanted to set up a test jig for batteries and if they can do that faster and more effectively then they can grow their business more effectively they're not interested in they're not selling a stm32 based infrared camera system they want to use something that doesn't exist right now to make their production process of batteries more efficient and that exists in open hardware suddenly he wasn't looking at a three-month development timeline with multiple iterations of of this system he was looking at taking this open hardware system making some minor modifications to connect to their their automation line and being up and running in weeks rather than months that's a huge win and that is made possible by open hardware combined with the sharing platforms the software uh, the code the text sharing platforms combined with KiCad with the ability to have anyone open that project and make improvements and modifications to their specific uh, to their specific use case that's you com awesome. you compare that with a with a closed source right. system that sure you can put that on on GitHub as well but there suddenly you're saying all right if you want to make these modifications to this open hardware project you need a license right right <laughs> go out, go out and and spend x number of thousands of dollars for a license to see if this project does actually meet the needs of your business and you can make the modifications to it and maybe it doesn't work right that's that's the difference there is is you can download keycad you can download these projects you can make the modifications you can use them for your business and Maybe he uploads his version of this to GitHub as well, adding to the amount of useful information out there in the world for the next person who comes along to improve on, to make it better. That's amazing. Yeah, that's a great ecosystem to be a part of. Uh, one thing, Seth, that customers really struggle with, and not just with us, but with any fabricator, uh, is if there's anything intricate in their design, how do I get a quote for that? And mm. how do I know that quote is good? Maybe I'm not completely done with my design. Maybe it's a budgetary quote. I, but I want to know that, hey, am I in the right ballpark for pricing? Mm. Um, that can be complicated for a complicated product. So one thing that I really like about KiCad is that it's easy to write plugins on top of that enable that type of interaction uh, and collaboration with our customers. Uh, in version 9 that you're about to release, um, we see more opportunity to 
facilitate communications specifically for quote mm -hmm. um, through KiCad and our backend systems in order to like make the customer's life easier and get you know basically get their pricing faster. Right. No, that's a, an excellent point. If you have a board that you're working on and you're looking at getting if it's if it's a two layer board like you already kind of know yeah. the ballpark of of what that is but for customers that are working on more complex systems uh, we talked about stack ups earlier if you have a specific stack up impedance controlled right. uh some other you you need a specific dielectric for for time for timing information to work to work out and you need your quote to to reflect that you generally have two options you either go out to your website right and type in all of the information and Hopefully it's hopefully it's right, but honestly, that's wasting a lot of engineering time transferring the information automatically. So I'm I really like the Sierra Circuit quote plugin that that you've created that that does that that transfers that information in a way that is fast and known to be known to be quality known to be comprehensive so getting accurate information from the design as it exists in KiCad is so much better use, using the using the quote plugin that that you've uh, that you've built and certainly you know, people who are who are using KiCad, if they're not already familiar with a number of the underlying options in the scripting system, should take a look at the Sierra Circuits Quote plugin because you utilize a lot of those underlying of those underlying calls to get in, get the data out, and format it correctly for 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 use for usage so it's a um a it's a it's an awesome reference for for people and d people who are designing complex boards it can be a time saver and if all it does is it saves you one spin it's paid for <laughs> itself time <laughs> many times over right because how expensive is it amit oh uh, it's free oh okay right <laughs> <laughs> yeah that no, was good yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for making uh, your software open so that that stuff is possible. I think that's amazing. Absolutely, we're we are looking to make the world a better place, one little project at a time. How well do you think KiCad stacks up to the other players mm. in the industry in terms of component and library management? So component and library management in KiCad is... Like footprints and... Sure, sure. So we're talking symbols for the schematic symbols and footprints for the, for the PCBs. People who come into... People who have used KiCad for many years have developed their workflows around the KiCad idiom. And when I say KiCad idiom, I, I just mean a common way of working. This is where you have a single footprint that may be referenced by hundreds of individual symbols. Companies develop their libraries around, around these idioms. So if a company has been using another PCB design software for many years, they have created a workflow that maps well to their idiomatic usage. That doesn't always translate directly to KiCad. It, it doesn't directly translate to other PCB, uh, other EDA softwares also, but in terms of 
KiCad, the pain points that people have identified to us are largely in metadata. So how do you manage and track metadata usage across different symbols and reuse the information that takes time to create? So symbols are represented by graphics and pins, as well as the metadata attached to those. Metadata might just be a unique ID for the company, might be the supplier information, it might be the availability, Rojas compliance, any of the elements that you need to make an informed decision about what you're using on your board. Thank you for listening to our podcast. The podcast is for you electrical engineers and PCB designers out there to learn from. And we also have an amazing discussion forum that we recently launched called Sierra Connect. So go there right now, post your questions, and industry experts will respond to your questions. It's an amazing resource that you should take advantage of. Those points, those pain points, we are addressing one by one, by one as we go along. Version 7 introduced the concept of database libraries. This was a huge benefit to many of our corporate users because this allowed them to take their existing KiCad libraries and manage the metadata in a SQL server, in a shared environment. So you could easily have a set of symbols and footprints that are used locally while still having the metadata managed by a uh, service that, or a database that links to online services to control update part availability or pricing, or potentially you have a in-house librarian who manages that sort of information for a large team of designers. That addition was was bi was big for a lot of corporate users, and I think that has been extremely useful. Our next step is the introduction of PDM integration, and the PDM integration is going to be in version. You know, we're looking ahead now, so this is the version. Looking at version ten, we've been improving our parts management and our parts integration with other software packages. You can use Eagle libraries, Altium libraries, uh, Altium DB libs. So keeping those sorts of, uh, of information synchronized across platforms, we've been put a lot of work into that as well. But the next step is going to be that life cycle management and keeping track of not just the individual parts, but also revisions on the boards, revisions on the, uh, the availability, alternate part information, all of the sorts of tracking data that you would use a, a large scale PDM for, that is, we're going to start integrating KiCad into that sort of environment. So uh, looking out, this is looking about a year, a year out. As soon as 9 is released, that's when we start building. 9 will be released February 2025. As soon as that's released, that's when we start putting these, putting these new features in. So sometime in early next year, that's when we're going to start building, building in those connectivities to uh, to PDMs like Windchill and uh, Profile and, and Autodesk Vault and, and online services that, not necessarily online, but, but network-based services that people use to collaborate not just between PCB designers, but between a prod different aspects of the product designers. Okay, well that sounds very exciting. We're certainly excited about it. Yeah, I know. It, sound, it sounds like uh, you guys are maturing a lot in terms of being able to service, you know, larger companies or 
not just the individual. So that is amazing. that is where our customer base is headed. And okay. one of the benefits of being an open source software package is that we don't we don't have financing streams that we need to service. So our programmatic decisions are based on what our, our user base tells us they need. And as our user base shifts to larger and larger corporations, that's when we start hearing more and more, we need ways for multiple people to collaborate together. So future features that we're building in version 10, multi-user uh, collaboration so that multiple people can work on the same board at the same time, same schematic at the same time, collaborating with version management. That should be in version 9. That will be uh, more collaboration tools coming, uh, coming in that fashion. And then parts, lifetime, product management in terms of a larger system, not, ju uh, not just within the PCBs. That, that's where we're looking at building everything out, uh, building everything out there. And hopefully we'll start hitting more and more of those, uh, of those user pain points and smoothing the edges for people. Oh, that sounds amazing. It really does. So as a PCB fabricator, I'm interested in how you support stack ups. Ah, <laughs> so we're going to talk about that. Let's talk about it. Um, I know there's plugins for stack ups, um, or at least I thought there was. Okay, sure. Um, tell us what your perspective is on PCB stack ups and what kind of support you're going to provide, or mm -hmm. are you dependent on the community to design plugins? That's what I thought, but go ahead. Well, let's see. Uh, so let's define stack ups a little bit. Okay. Right? Uh, you can have a, a number of different kinds of stack ups. What we natively support at the moment, version 8, version. Uh, so in version 8, which is the stable version at the moment, what we natively support is we natively support a stack up table that provides up to 32 copper layers with 32 dielectric layers of uh, configurable properties, with configurable properties. So you can create this and you can export a graphical item that represents this stack up table onto one of your one of your layers for documentation purposes. This stack up gets exported also in the 2581 format. Great. And it also gets exported in the uh, in the Gerber X3. Uh, so for the manufacturers that support Gerber X3, we can get that in there. Otherwise it's just a, a, a documentation layer that uh, people can view in their Gerber files. In version 9, that stack up table becomes a first class object. That means that it is does not need to be regenerated when you change your stack up. It will be automatically updated in the documentation layer. That is is beneficial to some folks. Version 9 will also increase the number of layers that you can have, both copper layers and documentation layers, mechanical layers, some some programs call that call them. Our numbers are we just said, well, let's see if we can just make the number of layers, usable layers, as many as people want. There, we don't know of any use cases where people need more than 32 layers, but that's not to say that they won't start existing. So we want to future-proof future that there. Certainly, many people will have more than 32 documentation layers. or are non-copper mechanical layers. You can dedicate layers to rename these layers, dedicate, dedicate a layer to your uh, representation of V grooves, dedicate a layer to your representation of mechanical placement and GD and T can go on one of these layers. You have lots of lots of options and having those options are, are really useful for people. So a lot of a lot of that went into 
went into there. Things we're looking at in the future are region-based layers. Right now, right. KiCad does not support region-based layers mm -hmm. natively. The way people tend to do that in KiCad is to create a documentation layer, draw a rectangle around the area in which they only want a certain number of layers. So if you have a rigid flex, maybe you have the uh, two-layer flex connecting to six-layer rigid boards, for instance. So you can draw a you can create a documentation layer where you draw a rectangle around the flex part and you say on these parts you only you only use FCU and BCU, right? Your front copper and your back copper and ignore the internal layers. That can that sort of documentation can be used by a fabricator to create the rigid flex, but it's not nicely represented in the, say, the 3D viewer for KiCad at the moment. That That's something that we're looking at for version 10. Oh, that sounds great. So do you think of the stack up as an integral part of the design process? With, yes. Without a doubt. It, the, okay. stack up, the stack up is critical for any number of things, including your timing matching right if you're if you're trying to do uh, length matching based on the arrival times of high speed signals you don't really care if it's 13.1 millimeters or 13.3 millimeters as long as your arrival time is still you know 50 nanoseconds for this and you know 50.1 nanoseconds for the for the second signal your 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 eye diagram is going to work out for there so having the accurate representation of the underlying materials that exist in the stack up allows us to do better simulations better length matching for high speed designs there's nothing that there's no downside to having accurate representation of the physical system. Oh, absolutely. Okay. And then in terms of IPC 2581 support, um, you can import a stack up that's 2581 format? Hmm. No, we do not uh, import 2581 stack ups. Okay. The, we export 2581 stack ups. The, we can certainly import stack ups from other KiCad projects and utilize templates, but I we haven't received a request yet from someone saying, I have a 2581 file. I want to use that stack up in a new KiCad project. I don't have any other formats available to me. Can we import this, uh, this from 2581? But if someone asks for it, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't be able to parse that information out of a 2581 file. Okay, good. I guess I'm asking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, uh, as a fabricator, we have our library of stackups, mm -hmm. uh, stackups that we've actually, you know, run first articles on the floor with that, uh, you know, dial in impedances. Right. So when a customer says, I want 50 ohms or 100 ohms strip line, we'll say, use this stackup. It could, mm -hmm. you know, and it'll meet your requirements. It could be Interesting. useful for okay. the, the process, right? Because right. in our manufacturing process, customers mm -hmm. and us, we like to collaborate and say, hey, use this stack up prior to even layout. Right. Be prior to, you know, placement huh. and routing, use yep. this stack up. And so it's, it, it's uh, one of the early on things. It's interesting. Yeah. I, uh, I, could see, I could see that being useful especially for manufacturers that don't want to create the KiCad project with the stack up in there. They just want to have the 2581 file. <laughs> Is that a file that you're able to provide to other, uh, other customers? They, yeah. they import the stack ups from the 2581? Yep. That's interesting. Yeah. I will uh, definitely have to look at that. Okay. That seems I can see that use case being, being useful for, for customers, especially in a uh, constrained you know, high 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 speed design as long as they talk to their manufacturer first exactly. now that's that's the critical part how do you get your customer to talk to you before <laughs> like i mean i guess that's a question for for you like how how do you convince a customer that 
no, you, you need to talk to us before you start designing and we will cut your design time. If you haven't heard of Sierra Circuits, Sierra Circuits is a PCB manufacturer and assembler all in one, located in the Bay Area, uh, right around all the innovation that's happening. And, and Sierra Circuits is capable of building everything from start to finish, uh, from simple standard product to uber complex, HDIs, flexes, rigid flex, high speed applications, you know, anything that you can think of, we pretty much can build. Uh, and we do it quick. Uh, so if you need to maintain your schedule and be on time, Sierra Circuits is your vendor of choice. Yeah, you know, in, in our, from our perspective, working with designers has always been a collaboration. And um, maybe on their first design, they didn't talk to us, but mm -hmm. soon thereafter, they're talking to us. So, <laughs> so it, goes, it goes potentially uh, sideways on the, on the first design. <laughs> and you reach out and say, oh, we could help you prevent this. Exactly. Come talk to me. I, I, I'll, we'll hold your hand on, yeah. on the next one, save you some money, save you some time. Exactly. And, uh, you know, we're trying to be even more transparent with materials we have in stock. Uh, so what cores, what prepregs are we hmm. having readily available if someone's doing an RF design mm -hmm. that they can, you know, kind of peek into our inventory and not worry about lead times of materials because, you know, after COVID, supply chains have all been disrupted, including right. materials. Mm -hmm. um, just everything's changed, you know, and having, uh, you know, insight into what a fabricator has in terms of cores, I think would be very helpful to customers. And mm. so we're, we're even doing that. We're going on that step as well. So that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Is especially in terms of a small quantity sure. development line, having that, uh, having that knowledge of what's available for a quick turnaround. I could see that be, being useful. So so you heard it here first. Talk to a meet before you start your design. <laughs> He'll save you some time. Exactly. Uh, great. And then, uh, how um, have you thought about? Okay, I have to ask, but you know, how have you thought about AI and how it would help designers in KiCad? You want to cut that question? <laughs> I can cut uh, that. Ah, that's what. That's uh, this is the question that everyone's asking and. It's so, it's funny because the only reason people are asking about AI right now is suddenly the models have learned how to talk, speak human language. Right. Speak human language. They've learned to accurately predict a contextually valid next token in human language. This bears only mild resemblance to the kind of machine learning that is useful in a circuit design context. So last night after the PCB West reception, they had a panel, and the panel was talking about AI in, in circuit design. And I had a moment where one of the panelists said something that stuck with me. He said, you know, AI might not be useful because we're, we're, we're talking about designers. You get two designers in the room and ask them where to put a capacitor. You get three opinions. Right? This is not, this is a, a, skill that has art associated with it. And art, by definition, can be subjective. And where to put that capacitor, there are some general rules. You definitely can tell, your good designer will definitely tell you where not to put the capacitor. But the valid space of where the capacitor could fit, you'll have a number of different number of different options. And one of the panelists said that you have these different opinions. AI could provide you with a neutral, his words, output, 
a neutral opinion on this question. And that word stuck with me because if there's one thing that AI is not, it's not neutral. AI is going to encode the best and the worst of humanity based on its training sets. And all of the common mistakes that people make, AI's definitely learned that all of those are valid solutions because they're common mistakes. So unless you have vetting, the best vetting out there to determine that this mistake is in fact a mistake, the fact that it's common means that it gets encoded in, in training data. And if you're using AI for your routing and your placement without a metric for what you would consider to be good and valid, and I don't think we have that yet. Yeah, I don't think that exists yet. Then all you're going to get is you're going to get a board that is definitely laid laid out with all of the worst design mistakes that people make because that's what always ha- always happens. You always get these mistakes, and you have to catch them. AI doesn't know their mistakes. So the real trick with AI is to say we don't want to put it in places where judgment is required because it doesn't have judgment. It has statistical inference. So places where it could be useful. Large language models are great for parsing human readable text. Data sheets are human readable text. Data sheets can be wrong, in which case we're going to encode wrong information into our large language model. However, if what you're using it for is to alert your designer to potential issues, oh, that's a win, right? If you can take a 100-page data sheet, have it digest the information and then look at your schematic and see if there are places in your schematic where you are creating a network that is not matching what the data sheet says that it should. So you have the wrong voltage level, say, on one of your power input pins. There's regular ERC is not going to catch that because it's just looking for power in, power out. It doesn't have the metadata encoded in those net, in those nets to say, this is supposed to be a 3.3 volt line and you're putting five volts on it. It doesn't have the metadata encoded in there. But if your AI is processing the data sheets and then using that to inform what it looks at on the circuit and then alerting the designer to a potential issue, you could reduce cycles. That would be a that's a fantastic place where where AI can make a real impact by assisting the EE in their verification of des- of design. But when anyone talks about a AI replacing a designer, that's not. Uh, that's that's not there yet because y- you you really need the AI to digest Horowitz and Hill <laughs> and all of the uh, uh, the four years of uh, of of graduate school and five years of design experience and mistakes. And then you can say, all right, AI, now go ahead and, and, and lay this out correctly. But we're, we're not there. The context, uh, the context windows are not nearly large. You have a, could have a library of 20 books in, you know, 200 books in your, in your context window. You're still not going to 
uh, be assigning the context correctly to the problem at hand. We'll get there eventually, but it's a it's not where we're at right now, and I don't think that there's enough money in it to make it a make it a priority. People will be focusing on using AI to make their valuable designers more valuable rather than using AI to replace their valuable designers because then all, all your like I said all you, all you're going to do is you're going to replace a valuable designer with the sum of all of the worst designers. <laughs> All right. Well, that was great. I'm glad I asked the question. I really appreciate your your input and insight on that. And it sounds very, very plausible, very good. So 